Hello YouTube viewers, welcome to my channel Science to Technology. In today's show, Camera Tuesday, we're going to talk about mirrorless Z6 Mark II from Nikon. So let's dive deep into it. So what is this puppy? Well, this puppy is directly targeting best selling camera price segment. Let that be very clear. You may think the cheapest camera sells a lot. No, why not? Well, those cameras have the highest uh, what you call uh, regret policy. So to say, meaning you buy it and you're like, okay, it can't do this. It can't do that. It can't do this. It overheats. It just has this limit, that limit. And uh, quite, quite often you'll be like, yeah, no. And nowadays because of the media and profession of uh, YouTube and Instagram, we have reviews where we can figure it out that if something is way too cheap, is generally buy and forget rather than buy and use so they do not sell a lot now what about flagship now flagships again uh, they are awesome they are flagship they are the highest a company can offer to its customer but the price is also a kidney worth kind of price so that's a big issue so in those sort of scenario you have a sweet spot just uh, you know just a bit above the bare minimum and quite below the quite flagships one because be mindful flagships do not sell enough so the profit margin on each piece has to be quite high so they really are ludicrously expensive even though the manufacturing cost is not that exponentially higher but they have to be because they're only gonna make 10,000 of them so they have to recoup the cost 10,000 50,000 or whatever have you basically it's like a small volume product so there is a very serious price band if you can have a good camera in that you can move numbers you can move volumes of it meaning instead of just selling 50,000 or 60,000 you can sell 100,000 or 500,000 so in that reason now which camera was very successful in this band Sony a7 mark 3 now this puppy put literally Sony on the map think about it this way there were two camera companies both were one century old and Sony just came in and just took their lunch how the heck that was even possible because of that a7 mark III sweet price spot it was not too cheap where it was like it was compromising on very essential functions for example dual card slots quality electronic we've had for that time let that be very good for that time so because it was not compromised it was selling like hotcakes and again a7 mark IV followed into the same steps and it was also good but again it was not like groundbreaking as a7 mark III a7 mark III was like genuinely whoa it changed the industry so Nikon is trying to do that for current world. So they are targeting $2,500 price and uh, in Indian price it's uh, 2,50,000 rupees. Yes, it's got far more expensive compared to direct conversion, but it is what it is. So they are directly targeting the G spot. So idea is it's not too expensive. So uh, it won't be price, uh, priced out of a lot of people's reach and it's not too cheap where the company has to take a like, you know, so drastic action that it becomes like a toy, which is like after people buying it, people are like, nah, man, not good. So that's the sweet spot. And what are they offering in return? Like for this sort of price bracket is genuinely, whoa. They are, they are like clever about it. What they are clever about is like 24 megapixel sensor. But here's the, all sensors are more or less the same. If you have a 24 megapixel full frame BSI sensor, uh, more or less is the same from Nikon and Canon and Sony and Panasonic and whatever have you. Because it's more or less the same. What are you making differently? Now there is an option two options so to say you can make a global shutter but only sony did that and red camera did that which are very very expensive uh, you can do stack sensor which is second best option now stack sensor is requires a whole uh, lot of electronics on the back of the system uh here's the deal it does work it's awesome but it costs a lot so what is the second best what if you have half partial stacked CMOS sensor meaning let's say you need four uh, analog to digital converter to uh, you know read out all the data very quickly what if you only had two four was expensive two is half expensive so that's why they will show you that there are two uh, bands here like one on the bottom one on the top so the idea is instead of requiring a back panel which has four layers uh, they only need two of them so it's a price cutting measurement with while actually giving you advantage meaning this uh, sensor's readout is genuinely ahead of all other 24 megapixel full frame systems at this price point because again you can directly compare it to like you know uh, sony is a full frame J um, you know global shutter then it's like bro don't even compare but for what it is for the price point this is like genuine edge it's like going from uh, jpeg only to raw so it's a huge advantage compared to all other camera in this price range they have cfast type b card which again i genuinely from bottom of my heart says f you to sony simply because they are the one who made this that's the sad part they are the one who made it if you remember a few years ago we had a new card format known as xqd made by sony used by sony and uh, nikon now sony only that time used it for their cinema lineup and uh, nikon used them but uh, because xqd was not selling c fast cards were not selling ssd based one so c fast and xqd got into bed together they made c fast type b 
And Sony is the one who is like, yeah, we're not going to use it, even though we designed it, physically built it. And yes, XQD and CFast are backwards and forward compatible. Meaning if you have an old Nikon camera that takes XQD, update the firmware, put a CFast type B, it will work. So that's why, like this card, because it's used by Nikon, Canon, Panasonic, Fuji, it's mass produced, meaning the price per gigabyte is quite low. So it's a very high speed uh, memory, quite cheap per gigabyte. While you compare this price to uh, Sony's uh, basically Type B one, uh, pardon me, Type A, that's ludicrously expensive and only few company makes it. Why? While Sony does sell enough module, they are not selling enough of them and it's quite new. While this had the advantage of A being older, B being compatible with XQD and C, every company is making it. Every company is making it and every company is consuming it. So it's much cheaper. So it's a really good system. And you have UHS-2 card SD slots. So quite a competent camera. That's what I said. If you make something too cheap, it's not that good of a value. This is like perfect sweet spot. Completely, precisely, directly hitting G-spot. So what features we are talking about here? Now this puppy directly took missiles at Panasonic and just boomed them out of existence because Panasonic became the big deal when it was like Panasonic is giving you Apple ProRes RAW. That was like, whoa. And this is like, hold my beer. Now Pro Apple ProRes RAW is really awesome for many, many, many people. However, the number of people who are happy with that is decreasing. Not, it's not Apple's fault. It's fault of Adobe. Adobe is starting to literally directly piss on the, their own community who are paying them. So other people are switching. A lot of people are switching. So at this point in time, you do not want to use uh, Apple ProRes RAW if you do not have a, another option. So for example, if you have Blackmagic RAW, it will work with every software, including DaVinci Resolve. DaVinci Resolve and Apple ProRes RAW are not making love together properly. So you have to use some other format. This has N RAW. Meaning this puppy can work with Adobe people and it can work with DaVinci people. No issue. That's like shut up, take money. That's clever. That's, that's why I said like they directly took a missile and fired it up, up Panasonic's ass. Now, Panasonic is generally much better than this simply because while that format is an issue, it is a weak link, uh, it does have SSD recording and 32-bit float recording. So Panasonic is still uh, ahead, but this was a very clever system. Now you may like, why the heck no company does this? Like why this is not a common feature? Well, there is a law. The law is patent law. That patent law was uh, obfuscated by a red company. Somehow red camera got a license, a patent lock on the fact that you should not be allowed to record raw compressed. They're like, you can record raw, but you cannot record raw that is compressed. If you have a quote unquote lossless raw uh, system, you sh cannot do that because that's a red patent. And you're like, that sounds stupid. Yeah, that is a stupid thing. That's genuinely stupid because your algorithms should be patented. Like this is how we are doing it. That algorithm should be protected. Absolutely, perfectly fine. It's like, what are you doing? That should not be, it's like, oh, I put four wheels on a box. Now it's a car. Now nobody else can put four wheels in a box. It's like, no, 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 that's not how it works. Like, again, okay, if you have, let's have, um, you know, a unique gear mechanism where it's like, okay, this gear is like, you know, so, uh, allows me to have four wheel drive while having less parts count. That should be patentable, not four wheel drive. So same, somehow, somehow Red got that patent and they were like really hammering it in, but uh, Nikon just bought them. So they no longer have to worry about it. And yes, there was a lawsuit. There was a whole filing on that. Uh, NRAW was like, and they thought NRAW can bypass it simply because it was using completely different patented algorithm that was already patented. So they were like, hey, we are using that. You cannot say that. But again, it was too much hassle. And Nikon was just like, let's just buy this bitch. So they bought it. So now they can give raw recording inbuilt without any issue. Other company does that. Well, then it goes to a Nikon. Nikon may decide to file lawsuits or not do it. So they have NRAW 12 bit, uh, ProRes RAW, uh, HQ 12 bit, H.264, H.265, both at 8 bit and 10 bit. So more than enough, meaning in terms of raw video power, only Panasonic can come close to it. And that the primary reason why Panasonic will win is simply because of that uh, SSD recording. Because yeah, that cards are expensive. And uh, this has the cheapest inbuilt RAW for full frame. Nothing else even comes close. Nothing, like nothing. Like you look into all the cameras. As of now, when I'm recording this video, nothing comes close. So flip out screen. Thankfully, Nikon learned uh, from their mistakes. It's like, yeah, there are 10 people who will complain about the flip out screen. There are 100 people who will buy the camera. So how about you focus on the 100 people who's going to buy the camera? So they're like, yeah, let's have a flip out screen. Yes, I do understand why some people are not comfortable. So there are options where like in Sony's and Panasonic's flagships, they have like double hinge design, meaning you can get that fill access, which everybody likes. And if you're like, hey, we want flip out, you also have flip out. So again, that would be expensive, but this is a very good compromise and it makes more than 80% people happy. 
Full size HDMI. I'm genuinely happy that Sony started this trend and everybody is following it. I have seen Fuji that has full frames. I have seen Panasonic that has full frame, uh, full size, and Nikon also. Only company that went backwards, regressed basically, is the Canon because I have Canon DSLR, uh, Canon 800G. It had mini HDMI, not perfect, but again much more robust compared to micro HDMI. Micro HDMI, if you look at it wrong, it blows up. So Canon is the only one that went like, what if we went more e-waste? Apparently, we have hundreds of planets to ruin. So what if we make more e-waste but i'm very happy now you're like it's not a big deal yes it's a big deal these are small things like how often do you connect your camera to your tv most answer would be no why not well cables are not there you need proprietary cable once you have something you know less friction uh, between your way of using it more people will use it if you are in a hotel you just want to show people uh, who is going to transfer the file just connect the hdmi and show it uh, many many things we can do if we have simple hdmi so that's there and the evf that's why I said like they went all out on this. Not only the sensor is one step above and one step below uh, full stack, one step above or bare minimum. So that's a good system. The EVF is like all out, flat out. Like they went all out on EVF. Either they got a, bra a brand new batch of new EVF OLED displays or they just went all out. Like there is no holding back on the EVF. EVF is genuinely better than their own flagship and no other brand even comes close. So it has 400 nits. That's like GG bright. That's so bright that you can be in a equator uh, beach like uh, India, Goa during summer and your eyes could be completely saturated and like, you know, pinhole like camera and you can put in your viewfinder. Viewfinder is like, I got you fam. Full brightness. It's like 4000 nits is like, whoa. And then uh, not only that, it actually has enough pixels. Resolution wise is quite high. It also has color space. D3 HDR color space. You will hear a lot of people complaining the fact that uh, uh, the colors are not looking the same compared to the EVF versus the display. Yeah, the display is lower grade. The EVF is full. Uh, basically, you have to understand camera sensor is not the weak link. It's the compressed video that we share to the world and display that renders it out is the weak link. That's why we have to do SDR and HDR. Camera sensor, lens, all the software, those, are, those can easily do HDR without any issue. It's just that how the heck you're going to show it. So having a D3 HDR, it shows you the color rendition that feels off. Why? Because again, you are expecting the colors to look what it looks on the LCD. LCD is a very low grade system. So they went all out. D3 HDR output, that's like, damn. And high refresh rate, because why not? So I'm pretty sure the EVF wise, they are like, sure to have take money. They went all in on the EVF. Either they got a brand new, uh, you know, semiconductor manufacturer is like, bro, I can build OLEDs for you. Or I have no idea how the heck they went all out. And you can see, they were showing Da Vinci. And I'm like, I get it why you're showing Da Vinci there. So. Oh, it also has a line level input. Again, audio wise, uh, Panasonic is better. 32 bit float input. Again, it does require external module, but you can do that. Here, you cannot do that. So, feature wise is genuinely good. Genuinely, like an EVO wise is like short of tech money. Genuinely, they are like genuinely giving exponentially better what everybody else is offering. So what about the performance? Now, performance of a camera system is defined by the SOC used silicon uh, system on chip. So this puppy uses the Xpeed 7, basically the flagship chip that they are using on their flagship models. Now, flagship models are awesome. They were very good, but here's the deal. If flagships were good, why the heck Nikons were not selling like hotcakes? Well, yeah, the you must have seen the first time they released uh, Nikon Z6 and Z7, everybody's like, dude, autofocus is just not as good as Nikon's own DSLR. Yeah, the SOCs were very underwhelming, so to say. And uh, the flagship SOC, they were not releasing it on the cheap one. This time it's like, no, take the flagship SOC, put it in the cheap system. Now, be mindful, Sony also does that. So whenever you are seeing a feature limitation, 90% of the time it's a product segmentation, not because of the physical hardware limitation. Sometimes there would be hardware limitation, like if you physically have a smaller board instead of having two card slots. Yeah, that's a one of those physical limitation. But if you have same SOC and one SOC can do uh, in one body can do 8K, in another is like, no, no, it can't do 4K, 60 FPS uncropped because, you know, blah, blah, blah. No, no, that's BS. So they are giving you a full fledged uh, high end processor, meaning the partially stacked CMOS can actually offer up the fast readout, meaning the SOC won't be the weak link where it's like, yeah, I, I am like, you know, sensor is reading out fast, but if the SOC cannot package it data quickly enough, it's useless. So SOC is no longer a limiting factor. It can actually give you autofocus where you will be happy. You will be like, I got this. Will it be as polished and as uh, just close your eye and trust as uh, Nikon and Sony? No, but it it is good enough where it's like, you just have to look at it once in a while. It's like, it's almost there. It's almost there. 
and in terms of polish wise you may just need to tweak the settings a bit but it will not fail you it's like it's, it's reached a point where it's like i got this and in terms of uh, just raw burst power it has a 20 fps full settings uh, electronic shutter and 14 fps at a mechanical shutter and buffer depth is quite good for this sort of camera it's 1000 shots of buffer depth and 120 fps is there if you want to compromise the resolution again it's not a proper global shutter do not expect 120 fps without any compromise it's like 120 fps at 10 megapixel so it's a really capable system. i'm genuinely happy with the small oled display that is on top for this sort of price range that's like good like that's why i'm pretty sure nikon just went okay 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 we will not cripple it we'll give you a camera that we can actually give you this literally screams that okay we are giving you what you want rather than what if we cripple this function what if we remove this function what if we give garbage here it's like no what if we give you the best we can give you now this is a great news for all of us why now first time i can say all three brands have a really good offering for that sweet spot uh, of the price band now uh, you can have good options in canon you can have good options in sony you can have good options in nikon and there are a signature to each camera basically people love how color renditions are done in different different brands and be mindful if you have a raw file you can do color rendition however you want to but you may not want to you may not be like okay i take the file now i color tweak it it's like you may not want to you're like hey to take the file and i do minor tweaks to it not color sign switching i get it that's up to you and that, again that's why you are earning money to spend the money how you choose so many people are like, I love Nikon's system. But again, while Nikon has awesome cameras, but all of their flagships are awesome. The lower ones are like just not good enough. So this is a really good offering. And given the fact that so much focus is done on video, because be mindful, photography, if your camera sucks nowadays on photography, you messed up. We are in 2024. If your camera sucks in photography, you messed up. So that's why focusing on video is so important and giving proper system where they are like uh, Sony's is like oh, no we have the same SOC as our A1 uh, instead of giving you 8k what if we crop at 4k 60 because we're we gonna say random things like oh it has to downscale it's like your system is downscaling from 50 megapixel it's more than good enough more than enough horsepower is there so same thing you have to understand this is a really good option for low cost kind of equipment and this puts pressure on every company in terms of price and in terms of cripple hammer rather than just crippling random things like this is why i hate canons it's like they had a good system for the early years they had micro hdmi that was good uh, mini hdmi sorry mini hdmi and they're like what if we had more garbage like you see how empty the space is like even fuji film figured it out in their tiny bodies how to put a giant uh, hdmi and they're like what if we know in their, they have this huge body and they have tiny HDMI. I'm like, and yes, people do use it. They do use it. There is a whole industry known as monitor industry. There is a whole industry of portable monitor with recorders. Uh, Atomos Ninja 4. There is company just because there are HDMI outputs in your camera. So, And again, people do not use it as much as they would because it's not the same port. Thankfully, Sony created this new trend. And again, other camera did hide it once in a while, but Sony kind of made it mainstream and every other camera is now joining in. So it's a really good system. It's a really happy for all of us. If Nikon can release a good camera like this, I do expect Sony's next camera to finally not have any uh, crop in 4K 60 FPS, unnecessary crop. I do not expect them to give raw or ProRes, but I do expect them to remove that 4K 60 crop limitation. And uh, Nikon's uh, at this point, if you want to buy this Nikon, so it's really good. Uh, so be mindful, uh, just look into the lens selection. If the lens that you are looking for is available at the price that you are happy with, go you on it. You will be happy and everybody else will also be happy because more competition equal more price competition. I do not like the idea how slowly every camera companies are becoming like, what if you remove this feature? It's like, what if you don't? <laughs> so I'm, I'm very happy with this. Nikon is finally taking on a right track. So this was my presentation on Nikon Z6 Mark III. Hopefully you have liked it, learned from it. In that case, please click the like button, share it amongst your friends. That will help me a lot. If you didn't like it, didn't enjoy it, I urge you to press dislike, press it twice to show me extra disappointment. Please leave a comment because I do try to reply to all of them. Subscribe, press the bell icon if you're free. And as always, thanks for watching.